So I love that question. Are we targeting the right people with the right message at the right time? I think that needs to be a mantra that I repeat to myself over and over and over again. So James, ever since we moved to Pittsburgh, coming up on, it's crazy to say this, but it's almost a year. Uh, I know October feels like we're going to blink and it's going to be October. So, but we've had people come into town, friends, family, and I don't know if you're this way, but at least for us, when we know someone's coming into town because we're still trying to get the house fully in order, like we have this long list of things that we want to do this room or remodel this thing. And it's like every person that comes and stays with us, that becomes a deadline. We need to finish this room by the time they're here. We need to do this in the living room or this in the basement. And so we've done this a couple of times already. Well, my best friends from Texas were in town this last weekend. And in the lead up to this, we're like, we have to finish the backyard. To give context, like two months ago, my parents were in town and that was the goal then. <laughs> and we started, basically we went to uh, a garden here in Pittsburgh. It's beautiful. It's like so perfectly landscaped. We saw it, we drove home. We're like, our backyard should look like that garden. And we like dug out this entire part of our backyard. A one, one day project ended up turning into like a three day project. We dug up a bunch of grass, laid a bunch of stuff down, like this whole thing. But we got halfway done because we never bought furniture for this per- portion of our backyard where we want to like host people, eat outside and all that. So I've just been staring at it for like the last two months. Like, Benji, finish this project. But I look at Marketplace and my wife makes fun of me because every time I go to buy something, I think of a reason why I shouldn't buy it and I postpone and I postpone. So last weekend, I'm like, I found it. I've agreed. We're like, money is ready. We're going to buy this like picnic bench for our backyard. And we don't have a truck. So I have to rent a truck from Lowe's or Home Depot, but it's first come first serve. So I have a friend meeting me at the house and I obviously I want to be back to the house on time. Like I'm a big obligations guy said, meet at 1130. I'll be back with the truck by 1130. I went to Lowe's, no truck. I go to Home Depot, no truck. I went to three different U-Haul places near us, no truck. And I was in a bad mood, man. <laughs> like this guy was waiting at my house for almost an hour And then I had to come home and tell him, Hey, like we have no truck today. We're just out of luck. Like there's, there is no truck in Pittsburgh that I can rent right now to move this table. And my wife was just, she knew to leave me alone because I was so angry for like the next two hours. Luckily my pregnant wife was game to on Sunday, find a truck and help me move this table. Just the two of us, even though she's she's pregnant, she's a saint. She's a saint. And, uh, we got it and my friends came into town. We ate every meal outside. And so that's the happy ending to this story. But, oh my gosh, there's no worse thing than spending an entire Saturday morning trying to trace down a truck, knowing you're leaving someone hanging. I, man, (laughs) it's the worst, but man, the payoff of outdoor eating. I mean, I, when I was in Pittsburgh with you a few weeks ago, I mean, the, the weather in the summer is not disgusting outside like it is in Orlando right now. It's so like, and, and I, we were just at, uh, my wife's aunt and uncle's, uh, beach house in Atlantic city in a town called Brigantine. And they've got this sick, like outdoor kitchen and nice yep. table outside right on their back deck, looking onto the bay. And, and there's just something about eating outside. You, you, if, if you're able to have like a fan above you to keep the bugs away to like, like little touches like that. But it's perfect. It, there's just nothing better. So as as much of a journey as it was, now now you get to reap the rewards. For oh, we've ate outside there. every night since we got the table. Like yep. it's perfect. And I, now I want to do work out there. So we got the it. umbrella and everything ready. But anyway, that's right. my story for today. We are going to look right. at a post from yes. Mary Keo. Uh, she's been on the podcast before we've brought posts from her in the past and we have another one that we feel like is worth highlighting this one had over 800 reactions 113 comments 41 reposts and i'll read it james and then get your reaction so she says this one of my favorite things about heading up marketing is i don't have to prove what minor marketing tactic drives results 
I know that each effort is part of an ecosystem. And I love the language she used there by thinking of it as an ecosystem. She said, the podcast doesn't drive results in and of itself. Paid ads don't drive results by themselves. Case studies don't drive results alone. Weekly live events aren't driving direct results. This is one of the biggest misses in B2B marketing, trying to tie results to individual tactics. The podcast creates a long form video file, which feeds our blog, which feeds our organic social content, which feeds ideas for live events and paid ads. And that's just the podcast. So then she could break down paid ads for you and all the other things that feeds case studies, these weekly live events, how they're feeding things. But she's saying just for the podcast, there's like four other things in the ecosystem that that podcast feeds. So to ask, is the podcast driving results or is it social media? That's the wrong question. The right question goes back to the fundamentals. Are we targeting the right people with the right message in the right places? I spend far more time on this question than any results oriented attribution question. End of post. So great succinct way of saying it. I think again, to go back to her first line before I throw it over to you, she says that it's one of her favorite things, heading up marketing. And this is the type of marketing leader I want to work for because it's someone who knows we are spending energy creating these things. And they're all part of the overall ecosystem we've crafted to yes, lead capture, but also lead create. And these things all work in conjunction so that we have better, more well-rounded uh, whether it's paid ads, case studies, weekly live events, or shows. So James, immediate thoughts as you hear this post. Immediate thoughts are, I think a lot of marketers resonate with this because they have experienced themselves working for a leader, call it a CEO, call it, maybe they roll up to CRO and the CRO has a background in sales. And when you are, when you are responsible for moving the needle on something, or you're getting asked, uh, about a specific campaign, driving a specific result, because the company needs this to work. I very much understand why, why most marketing leaders don't necessarily look at it this way as part of an ecosystem because it usually somebody usually has an idea and i'm usually the one guilty of this in our organization where i'm like oh we should do we should do events we need to go all in on events we need to try events and we set a rock around it we rally the troops around we're going to do this event we're going to do b2b growth live in boston around inbound it's going to be awesome we're going to invite da, 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 all these people to be a part of it and then there's all this pressure on that, that one idea performing and you have to be able to zoom out and go, that is just one of the many things that contribute to us being able to solve, you know, whatever problem we're trying to solve whenever we came up with the idea to do these events. So for us, it's like, we need to drive new business now that there's more competitors in our space. Um, we're not getting the kind of inbound that we used to once get. So we need to be more proactive in, in proactively getting in front of the type of people that we want to buy from us. And we want to do that relationally. And through these events is, is like how we're, how we plan to solve that problem. But there was a point, uh, uh, this is like a recent uh, story for me, because it was our, our, our recent goal setting exercise for our leadership quarterly, where it was like, we had to, we had to get to a place where we're like, this is not ultimately going to solve the short-term pain that we need to solve tomorrow because really there's not, there's not I mean there there are things you can do in the short term but most of uh I, I've just found that uh a lot of this stuff takes time and it takes an ecosystem like she says of activity that are the right activities targeting the right people at the right time and so I love that question are we targeting the right people with the right message at the right time. I think that needs to be a mantra that I repeat to myself over and over and over again. If you're a regular listener, a content creator, or if you've ever just doom scrolled LinkedIn when your boss thought you were working, you already know that hot takes are selling like hot cakes in the B2B world. Online armies of thought leaders assemble in mass to remind you 
that everything you've ever known, done, or said is wrong, and they're going to teach you a better way. But before you blindly follow, you should know how to separate the hot takes from the hot air. And that can be easier said than done, especially for us as busy professionals. That's why at B2B Growth, we paid our writer a handful of loose change, pocket lint, and a promise of valuable exposure to do it for us, saving you the time and the headache. The B2B Growth newsletter takes a look at a popular B2B Growth marketing opinion and then pits it against an influencer's contrarian point of view. Find out what we've uncovered by subscribing to our newsletter now, which you can do at b2bgrowshow.com slash newsletter for the low, low cost of free. Again, subscribe to the newsletter, b2bgrowshow.com slash newsletter. It seems like it's it's really content road mapping and going, this is, to, to use her language of right people, right message, right place, thinking of your content in that direction. Like what's the most helpful piece of, if we're just going to talk specifically to content right now, the most helpful piece of content you could create for each stage of that person's journey. Like how can this one thing resonate with that part of like where they are right now? And and that could be anything from a show to a paid ad to a case study. You see people doing all of those well because they're talking to specific parts of essentially a content roadmap. And this is, this is where this plugs in and we're answering the, the question that this person might have at this, at this stage. Uh, I also like it because it's, oh, when we talk about the long-term goals, most of it comes down to consistency and content creation. So you can get strategics with, with topics. You can continue to grow affinity for your brand, speak to ideal clients, um, some in market, many not yet in market, but the consistency of content creation then flows into all these other things. It's like, oh, this resonated with this thing we created. Now we can create social on the back of it. So when she uses, she has that question of like, she hates when someone asks, is this podcast driving results or is it social media? If you're doing it right, you should scratch your head at that question and go, well, our social sort of drives people over to the show and our show sort of drives people over to social and like this melting pot is happening where people are engaging with us because we're creating this content that resonates. Our paid ads got better because we figured out the messaging because we have a routine time set every week for this live event that we do. So that's what she's talking about with this ecosystem is it's all helping your messaging because you set up these consistent cadences for your content to thrive versus going, okay, well, we need this because we saw X person or X company execute on it effectively. Uh, there is this str strategic roadmap, your content roadmap that you're executing. Uh, and, and she harps on this over and over and over again. So that, that was one of the main takeaways for me. I love it. Yeah. I, I think this mindset can be really transformational. She also tagged a meme on here which i thought was hilarious it's the meme of the guy it looks like a superhero sweating over what button to push and it's one button is give credit to the podcast the other button is give credit to paid so <laughs> just a just a really uh well done meme to couple with just a phenomenal caption with great thinking uh it's not surprising at all that this thing picked up 815 uh, reactions and 113 comments, 41 reposts. So, you know, it, you know, it hit when you're, when you've got 10 plus reposts of, of, uh, of something and the marketing millennials guy commented on it. Um, you know, what's interesting, James, one thing that I, again, it's like, you want to end up in a follow-up conversation with, with Mary, or we do a lot of these episodes where I'm like, I would have this question for them as a, someone who creates and is thinking through marketing strategy, but she talks about, trying to tie results. Um, she, she says like the podcast creates the long form video, which feeds the blog, which feeds our organic social content. W thinking of it as like, if you get the podcast slightly wrong, or if it's too much product marketing and not enough, uh, affinity building or like speaking to where your audience is, it could have a ripple effect to your ecosystem that is poor. So you really have to get that right in order for all of those things to, to work. And I do think that that's a big problem when you think of lead capture versus lead creation, where companies end up navel gazing 
and they're kind of creating a podcast trying to convince people or like they're only creating videos for people that are already in market down funnel. So then all of their content ends up not resonating. So I, w I would want her to, to kind of suss out for us. How does this work as far as when you create a show that's creating all these things on the back of it, how do you make sure that it's, you know, the blog is what it needs to be? Like, who are you targeting? I just think there's like several sort of um, strategy questions that, that it brings up for me that I would want to just learn from, take notes on because you, I could see someone trying this and doing it relatively ineffectively, even though they're doing what she says. <laughs> yeah. All right. But, yeah. I've, I've got the YouTube shout out today okay. and, uh, it is, it's a big one. So it's an account with 1.18 million subscribers. It's a brand we all know and love. Uh, well, maybe some of us, Maybe some of us love uh, their competitor more than this one, but you actually mentioned them at the top with your story, trying to trying to rent a truck from them. It okay. is Lowe's Home Improvement. Lowe's Home Improvement is the YouTube channel, and the reason I shout this out, uh, they they clearly are putting a lot of effort, a lot of dollars into their YouTube channel. Um, you know, even it, it's easy to look at a brand like that and go, oh yeah, of course they've got over a million subscribers because they're Lowe's, but there are a lot of companies that you would think would have way more subscribers on YouTube uh, with the kind of dollars they have and they don't. So hats off to Lowe's. They're really putting an effort here. Uh, but the reason this is uh, top of mind for me is because they've got a new content franchise uh, as part of their media that they're producing uh, called uh, Sibling Space Solvers. And hmm. it is my buddy, Philip and his sister, Elise, who's my other really good friend, uh, Mac's wife. So uh, Mac was a groomsman at my wedding, actually. So, and my wife is really close with Elise, uh, Philip's sister, and Mac's wife. So and cool. So uh, they end up. The, so, so it's like an HGTV style concept, um, but because Philip and uh, Elise are brother sister, they really played off that dynamic. Originally, the show is going to be centered around Elise because she's super creative and she designs these really cool spaces. Um, and they love the dynamic so much between her and her brother, who's like the contractor that she brought in to help actually do the build. Um, they love that dynamic so much that they actually reshaped the premise of the show in post-production with wow. the footage that they had. So they ended up using like, I think they ended up using like every shot they had with Philip in it because for future episodes, uh, they, they want that to, they want to press into that dynamic more of the siblings. So go check out, uh, I think it, it right as of right now, the video was posted six days ago. So it might be, uh, deeper in their feed by the time we get this episode out, but it's called chaos to calm living room makeover sibling space solvers. So if you just search Lowe's sibling space solvers, you should see it and you can go check out my friends, Elise and Philip shining, shining bright on the Lowe's platform, which is just super. Cool. <laughs> That's awesome. While you're over there, go check out B2B growth as well. We are on the journey to 150 subscribers right now Boom. and constantly learning and growing and more to come. So with that, James, do the honors. We are out.